Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan, brilliant scientist, trusted colleague, nuclear spy. There's no doubt that A.Q. Khan has made the world a much more dangerous place. He's made it much more likely that a terrorist group could one day get their hands on the nuclear bomb. Khan's master plan, to steal Europe's nuclear secrets. Build an atomic bomb for Pakistan. This is it. And set up a smuggling network to sell those secrets on to Middle Eastern states, from Libya to Iran. It's very dangerous if Iran gets the bomb. And let me just add, if there had been no AQ Khan, we would not have a crisis now. The cost would be in the region of 100 million US dollars. Of course, we would pay. This was one-stop shopping. This was everything from enrichment of uranium to the actual warhead design. A nuclear network reaching as far as North Korea. I will not stand by as peril draws closer and closer. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. But the West did too little, too late. It could have been stopped, without any doubt in my mind. I think it's one of the, the biggest failures in history. So we're all going to pay the price. The mastermind behind the biggest global nuclear smuggling ring, A.Q. Khan, is accused of being the most dangerous man in the world. Khan is not permitted to tell his own story, and in this film he is played by an actor. Thirty-five years ago, Pakistani scientist Abdul Khan set out on a path to power and notoriety. He got a job at Europe's largest civilian atomic research consortium, Urenco. He was soon well liked by his colleagues. A.Q. Khan was obviously a very bright metallurgist. He was more than that. He was someone who was easy to get on with. And he was uh, someone who we believed you, he, you could rely upon. Urenko's thousands of gas centrifuges provide the uranium fuel for Europe's nuclear power stations. Centrifuges can also enrich uranium for use in an atomic bomb. Known to the Pakistani secret service as Agent Karim, Khan was on a spying mission. He was forbidden access to all classified material, but security was lax. Good evening, Dr. Khan. Working late? No, no. Uh, I'm just uh, writing to my family in Pakistan. You see, uh, they're always complaining. They never see or hear from me. OK. I'll see you on the way out. Yes. Still unsuspected, Khan flew to Pakistan at Christmas 1975. He took with him his Dutch wife and their two young children. 
He wrote to his employers saying he had contracted yellow fever and then he never came back. And it would take the Dutch years to discover what Khan had stolen and why. The young nation of Pakistan had recently suffered a crushing defeat by India. Khan's own family were Muslim refugees from India and he looked to the Islamic Republic as a safe haven. Khan vowed his country would never be humiliated again. A.Q. Khan was motivated by fierce patriotism, fierce nationalism, a desire to defend his home country of Pakistan and he saw delivering Pakistan the atomic bomb uh, as a means to delivering Pakistan security. That was his original motivation, protecting his own country. Pakistan's leader, President Bhutto, swore the nation must have the bomb, even if it meant the people had to be grass to pay for it. It was a terrifying prospect. An atomic arms race in one of the world's most volatile regions. The next war between India and Pakistan could lead to a nuclear holocaust with global fallout. Instructions to find a location for a top secret research facility. The code name was Project 706. Khan chose Kahuta in the foothills of the Himalayas. This is it. This is where we will build the plant. His task, to deliver Pakistan's nuclear bomb, the first in the Islamic world. Khan has since told his biographer how he built the Kahuta plant from scratch, relying on foreign suppliers. I took full advantage of the willingness of Western companies to do business and decided to buy from the open market. And there were plenty of takers, nuclear profiteers, happy to exploit the lax export regulations in exchange for a fat profit. They begged us to purchase their goods. And for the first time, the truth of the saying, they would sell their mothers for money, dawned on me. We purchased whatever we required. Where are you coming to Pakistan? His next step, to create fuel for a bomb. Khan needed to smuggle centrifuge parts out from the West. Khan's agents made contact with German businessman Gotthard Lurk. In this film, all dramatizations of members of the Khan network are based on intelligence reports and legal documents. These are the details of what we require. There should not be a problem. We supply this technology to many customers. And delivery? Will you have any problem with exporting these goods? No. This will not be an issue. You require no special permission from our government. 
Much nuclear technology is dual use, usable for peaceful purposes or for the bomb. A loophole Khan often exploited. Such deals were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars to Lurk's company. And with contacts all over Europe, Khan's bomb project rapidly accelerated. They were operating throughout Western Europe, to some degree in the Middle East. They had people all over the place and involved a number of businessmen, friends of A.Q. Khan's from his days in Holland and Germany, and many, many others. You know, they would purchase things using um, false end users, um, multiple trans transshipment points to disguise the fact of the ultimate destination being Pakistan. Um, a very sophisticated operation. In the 1980s, the Dutch Secret Service launched an inquiry into Khan. His former colleagues at Urenko realized the enormity of his betrayal. He took the drawings of at least two designs of centrifuge from the Netherlands. He took them together with the lists of European suppliers who he knew then he could go back to and very quickly get the necessary raw materials, components and equipment. In 1983, the Dutch charged Kahn with nuclear espionage. Kahn protested his innocence to the press. It was the most concerted and vicious campaign ever launched against anybody since the Second World War. I was presented as a fanatic Muslim devil, a James Bond or a Dr. No or what not. The Dutch initiated a false and concocted case against me without my knowledge. The Dutch sentenced Khan to four years in jail. But in a curious turn of events, the legal papers were never served correctly and Khan was acquitted on a technicality. He continued to defy the West. Whatever we achieved at Kahuta is purely due to our own hard work. A hundred percent Pakistani effort. And no foreigner has helped us in any capacity. By 1985, Western intelligence already knew what Kahuta really was. A CIA report from that year has been recently declassified. Pakistan has had personnel and facilities dedicated to the pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability since 1971. These resources are involved in the design, fabrication, and testing of high explosives and nuclear weapons parts. The West pressured Pakistan to cease their nuclear program. Khan retaliated with a blunt letter to the German press. I would like question this bloody holier-than-thou attitude of the Americans and the British. These bastards are the God-appointed guardians of the world to stockpile hundreds of thousands of nuclear warheads and have the God-given authority to carry out explosions every month. And if we, if we start a modest program, we are the Satans, the devils. Khan had thwarted European justice, but Western intelligence continued to follow him on his travels. One of his frequent destinations was particularly alarming. China. Salaam alaikum. Neha, neha. Very good to see you. What business did Agent Karim have with a communist superpower with the world's third largest nuclear arsenal?
conventional surveillance methods on Khan fail to provide enough details of his dealings with China. So the CIA mounted a bold operation, which they still refuse to discuss in detail. All I can say is that the Chinese provided invaluable assistance to Pakistan's nuclear efforts. Okay. And I'd say the rest of it I can't go into because, you know, it's, it's, it's quite classified. They shadowed Khan on one of his frequent foreign trips and picked their moment. I had asked uh, someone to book me a plane ticket to Islamabad. Could you please find out if it has been done? The contents of Khan's briefcase confirmed that Khan had obtained the Chinese design for a nuclear warhead. Do you need your passport number, please? Yes. The CIA now knew the full significance of Khan's trips to China. Excuse me. Thank you. The nuclear weapons design which the Chinese provided Khan was vital because it was a tested design. It was a design that the Chinese had already found to be working and usable. And it was also a design for a bomb that could be fitted onto a missile and therefore could be delivered anywhere. Khan was also working on missiles, uh, as well as nuclear fuel, and now weapons design. So if you put that together, Khan really had everything you needed for a deliverable nuclear bomb. It was a major breakthrough for intelligence, but stopping Khan was now no longer a priority. Afghanistan. Throughout the 1980s, a bloody battleground for invading Soviet troops and the fundamentalist Islamic resistance. American policy. Defeat the Russians at all costs and bring down the evil empire. and they needed a regional ally. It's clear that during the 1980s, the US was receiving some very troublesome information about Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. At the same time, of course, the US was depending on Pakistan as a conduit of assistance to the Mojahideen in Afghanistan in the hope of evicting the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. So even though the U.S. was aware of a number of these activities, it was very reluctant to come down very hard on Pakistan. Khan took full advantage of Pakistan's change in status. By the mid-80s, such was his confidence that his network even started to operate in the United States. Khan was after hardware to update his uranium centrifuges, but it was a step too far. We felt something had to be done, and so we took certain steps. What we were dealing with at this point was violations of US criminal law. 
as opposed to the Khan network's activities overseas. Barlow oversaw a sting operation on a Pakistani-born businessman, Archie Pervez. Pervez was suspected of being a frontman for the Khan network, and he was after some very sensitive technology. I learned that Archie Pervez was attempting to purchase 25 metric tons of something called 350-grade Malaysian steel. Malaysian steel is an export-controlled, ultra-strong steel, which has very, very limited uses. The reason it's controlled primarily is, is, is that it's used to make rotors for gas centrifuges to enrich uranium. The team needed to know who Pervez was buying for and where the steel was being smuggled to. One container will pick up on the 15th. I want you to inspect both shipments, though. Sure, I will. I'll pick up the other a week later. The reason I'm picking up two shipments, we want to recycle the money. Recycle the money? OK. OK. I want to protect my clientele. Finally, Pervez let slip what they needed to know. Uh -huh. Good. The Kahuta plant is ready. It's going to the Kahuta plant. Okay. Kahuta, is that uh, the correct pronunciation? Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Pervez had no idea it was a sting. Mr. Pervez, you're under arrest. U.S. Customs, please turn around. You have the right to remain silent. Archie Pervez was convicted for the attempted export of the material for the Pakistani bomb program. But the reaction of Barlow's political masters would come as a complete shock. The arrest caused a massive firestorm in Washington here. You know, the Congress was up in arms because they just approved $4.2 billion of aid to Pakistan, and suddenly this happens. And so, you know, there were, there were demands for, for a hearing, and I was sent down by the CIA to testify in a closed session hearing. The congressmen were very angry over this. Barlow's operation had come at the wrong time for Washington. Maintaining the alliance with Pakistan in the Afghan war against the Russians was more important than disrupting the Khan smuggling ring. My agency career was basically ruined. I became a traitor in the view of some people who were running the Afghan war. It's been the most damaging experience I've ever had in my life. You know, it's affected my personal life, my career, you know, um, it's had a profound effect. It's, uh, it's, it's really intolerable. In 1987, the very year the CIA was warned off from pursuing Khan, he expanded his operations into the Middle East. His headquarters were in Dubai, and the nature of his business was changing. The network was employing frontmen like BSA to here. Yes. A young, ambitious Sri Lankan, he ran a respected computer business, the SMB Group. We can guarantee on-time delivery and offer a full technical support. We would prefer a cash payment up front, but you can pay by check. SMB computers. The cost. The cost would be in the region of, say, 75,000 US dollars. Not a problem. Good to do business with you. Salaam alaikum, beta. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. How are you? Very well. Welcome to Dubai. Thank you. Thank you. Tahir, often described as Khan's surrogate son, would rise from a lowly position in the procurement network to become the key figure after Khan himself. Are you ready to do it? Good. 
From Dubai, Khan plotted his next move. Dealing directly with Middle Eastern regimes hostile to the West and in the market for nuclear weapons. Ah, Stalikum, Heinz. Stalikum. Please, please sit down. Say it better. I would like you to meet a friend of mine, Mr. Heinz Mabus. German businessman Heinz Mabus had already sold technology to the Iraq nuclear bomb program. Now, I, I thought it's very important that the two of you should meet because Heinz understands, well, perhaps more than anyone, the nature of our business. The West completely missed that in Dubai, Khan and his associates were not just buying, they were selling. It was a catastrophic failure of intelligence. In the 1980s, the US, the UK and other countries were watching the Khan network in terms of building Pakistan's own bomb. In the 1990s, Western intelligence agencies lost track of Khan. They really didn't appreciate what he was doing. They didn't understand that he'd made a shift from building Pakistan's own bomb to being a salesman. It would be years before the West obtained the first evidence that Khan was selling. They had to wait until after the first Gulf War, when UN weapons inspectors went into Iraq to check on Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, including his atom bomb project. At a chicken farm in the Iraqi desert, they uncovered a treasure trove of documents. Now at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, where Khan's former colleague at Urenko, Trevor Edwards, works as a weapons inspector. Still classified, the chicken farm documents include the AB, or atom bomb memo. The memo reveals that in 1990, the Iraqi Secret Service had received an offer from Khan's network. Dr. Abdel Qadir Khan is prepared to give us project designs for a nuclear bomb, materials from Western European countries via a company he owns in Dubai. Ironically, Saddam turned them down because he thought it was a CIA setup. Yet Saddam's regime would eventually be destroyed by the Americans and British, claiming he had weapons of mass destruction. Inexplicably, the West did nothing to stop the very man who had tried to sell Saddam nuclear secrets. And so during the 1990s, Khan and his network were allowed to become very rich on the proceeds of successful sales to other clients the West knew nothing about. Khan became a multi-millionaire with a large property portfolio, a collection of vintage cars and a taste for tailor-made suits. Here, I'll take uh, two shirts of the same size, please. Thank you. I think Khan was motivated by a mixture of greed and idealism. Greed was definitely there. He amassed a large amount of money. But he also did have wider ideological motivations, motivations uh, partly centered around resentment of the West, partly centered around a desire to spread the, the bomb to as many countries as possible because he believed it was the right of countries to have a nuclear bomb for their own security if they wanted it. May 1998, 
Pakistan exploded its first bomb in response to Indian nuclear tests the same month. The threat of atomic warfare on the subcontinent between the two enemies was now ever-present. But overnight, Khan became a hero in Pakistan and much of the Muslim world. I remember how President Musharraf praised me to the Pakistani people. Allah Almighty has heard our nation's prayers. You are a national hero. Your place in history is assured. I think the ultimate event was the test in 1998. It was a clear-cut signal to their Islamic brothers that it could be done and it's been stated by AQ Khan and, 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 and other leaders in Pakistan from the beginning that this was not just the Pakistani bomb, that this was the Islamic bomb. And, you know, I think that uh, that's something of grave concern. AQ Khan was instrumental in Pakistan getting the bomb, which has heightened the chance of nuclear war in South Asia. Also, you have to worry that a future government may become fundamentalist and then may use its nuclear arsenal to confront the West and become much more provocative and aggressive. So you have to worry a great deal about, about the nuclear assets in Pakistan. The research laboratories at Kahuta now began brazenly advertising nuclear technology at international arms fairs. But who was Khan selling to? There were a number of warning signs that Khan might have been up to something more dangerous. There were signs from Khan's unusual travel. He was travelling to a, a lot of countries around the world where it wasn't clear exactly what he was doing. One of these countries was the brutal communist dictatorship of North Korea, which was actively seeking nuclear weapons. The Koreans provided Pakistan with missiles for their atomic arsenal. In return, Western diplomats suspected Khan provided them with centrifuges, which Pakistan denied. As concerns grew in the late 1990s, intelligence on Khan was made top priority. A joint task force was set up between MI6 and the CIA. It was agreed between the two sides that they'd share everything, but that it would be a very small team and that no one outside the teams would be told about what they were doing. The task force concentrated on Khan's activities in Dubai and the Middle East and made a shocking discovery. For a valued customer as yourself, I think it is important that we should meet in person of Khan's network was dealing with one of the West's sworn enemies, Colonel Gaddafi. Libya had orchestrated terrorist attacks against the West, including the Lockerbie atrocity, which cost 270 lives. The intelligence team knew Libya wanted to buy nuclear weapons materials and suspected Khan was prepared to sell them. The question was, what to do about it. We had to make a decision. Do we stop this activity or do we watch it uh, longer uh, in the hope of understanding it better so that when we moved against it, we could uh, take it out by the roots. And it was clearly the preference in Washington to watch it, track it better. And when we understand it better and feel we can eradicate it uh, more completely to take action only then. But the pursuit of Khan was suddenly thrown off course. Nine Eleven strengthened Khan's position, just as the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan had done 20 years earlier. September the 11th attacks hugely complicated and slowed down efforts to stop AQ Khan. 
That's because all of a sudden Pakistan was a very important ally for the United States. The US needed Pakistan's help in going after al-Qaeda and going after Osama bin Laden. And that was a problem in dealing with AQ Khan, because to deal with Khan, you needed to put pressure on Pakistan. And doing that was very difficult because of Khan's status as a national hero. The Americans pressured Pakistan to rein in Khan. President Musharraf called him in person. This is indeed an honor. Nothing, uh, President Saab. This is a routine trip. I, I do it so often, and you know that uh, there is no problem. There's nothing to be worried about. President Saab, why are you bothering yourself with the details? You know that when I am there, everything will be okay, inshallah. Despite the warning, Khan continued to sell Pakistan's atom bomb technology. But his cover was about to be blown. Iran, the hardline Islamic Republic, and another Middle Eastern state with nuclear ambitions. In 2002, an Iranian exile group revealed to the world the existence of an unknown uranium enrichment facility. Six months later, after intense diplomatic negotiation, UN inspectors gained access to Iran. We've reconstructed their investigation. They headed straight for Natanz. They offered us a helicopter ride from Tehran to Natanz, but we decided that let's take a car. We drove that 250, 300 kilometer stretch from Tehran to Natanz. And with a high speed, it was all the time 170 kilometers per hour when we are pushing, because most of the time it's actually almost like a desert. When you get there, you realize that the whole complex is very secretive. The major plant will be underground once it's built. It's not yet built, but once it is built, it'll be underground. And above ground, there is a pilot plant under construction. The inspectors were taken to a conference room and presented with details of the enrichment program. The Iranians claimed they had nothing to hide. He said that we have developed this all by ourselves. We have used certainly all public information which was available. The project has lasted, had lasted five years and basically used internet, etc. And that's what you see and this is a genuine Iranian centrifuge. I went into the pilot plant. I also went into the workshops. Now in the workshops they had uh, a model of a centrifuge which they said was an indigenous designer centrifuge. However, when I walked into the room, I recognized it within 10 seconds as the Dutch designer centrifuge that I had known in the 1970s. It was based upon the technology acquired by A.Q. Khan from when he was in the Netherlands. Suspecting the Iranians were not telling the truth about where they had obtained their centrifuge technology, the inspectors visited other sites. The Iranians claimed that this was just an old watch factory. Their investigation was to reveal far more. There were boxes and cartons piled up against the windows and piled up against the doors. And very strangely, the uh, janitor could not find the keys for these buildings. 
and we uh, realized that some parts of the building had been totally renovated. So all the ventilation system had been taken out, new nice tile floors and walls were in place. The swipe samples later revealed traces of uranium. The site Kalai had been used for attempted enrichment. But far more worrying, chemical analysis showed the centrifuges could not have been built in Iran. Conclusion, the Iranians were lying. Then they had to do a hard choice, either stick to their previous explanations and just say, we don't know where it comes from, or you come with the explanation. And they decided to go for explanation. And this, then the story started to unravel, because then they said that actually it was not entirely genuine. We had got technology from abroad. To the astonishment of the inspectors, the Iranians confessed. They had held a series of meetings with the car network starting 16 years before in Dubai in 1987. Khan had three trusted lieutenants at the 1987 meeting. To hear his uncle, Mohammed Farouk, and the German businessman, Heinz Mabus. Gentlemen, Dr. Khan sends his apologies that he cannot be here in person, but he sends his best wishes and assures you that we are more than capable of meeting with your request. Please. Now, what you see in front of you are the blueprints for the P1 centrifuge for uranium enrichment. The designs are European. And have successfully been built by Dr. Khan in Pakistan, where they are fully operational. So, gentlemen, it's simply a matter of how much you're willing to pay. The Iranians wrote a check for three million dollars. Oh, to his uncle, Mohammed Farouk, took it straight across town to make sure it wouldn't bounce. The check cleared. Khan had helped Iran along the road to nuclear power. Gentlemen, we are in business. Business with you. Go to the business with you. The Iranians also revealed that later, Tahir sold more centrifuge designs and components. Price, several million dollars paid in cash. Clearly, the US was looking in the wrong place. The Pakistani-Iranian link was off our radar screen. We were just not aware of what was taking place in that channel. And I think that was uh, a considerable failure of intelligence. It was now known that Khan had tried to sell to Iraq. There was no hiding the fact that Khan had sold to Iran, and details of even more lucrative deals were about to emerge. Libya. In a dramatic twist in 2003, Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi announced he wanted to end years of international isolation. The bargaining tool, a promise to give up his ambitions for nuclear weapons. Months of secret talks followed, but the joint MI6 CIA operation had set its sights on stopping Khan once and for all. This group divided up the targets. They divided up the businessmen in the Khan network and agreed which of them would target each of those businessmen to try and turn them, to try and get information from them, to try and eavesdrop on them. And they soon got a breakthrough implicating Libya. A Malaysian engineering company, SCOMI, had been awarded a contract worth $13 million by Tahir. 
The factory was told that the specialist equipment was for the Middle Eastern oil industry. And Scomi believed this to be the case. But the project was overseen by Swiss engineer Urs Tinner, the son of one of Kahn's associates who had supplied Kahuta in the 1980s. The MI6 CIA team activated a double agent at the heart of the Khan network. He provided the evidence they needed. The Malaysian factory was building centrifuge parts for the Libyan atomic bomb. In 2003, the same source provided an invaluable tip-off. A container ship, the BBC China, was bound from Dubai to Libya. They seized the chance to move against Khan, diverting the ship to Italy. Here, a joint team of CIA and MI6 weapons experts waited to examine the cargo. Inside, centrifuge parts bound for Libya, some from the Malaysian factory and others from Khan's Kahuta plant. Libyan diplomats were urgently summoned to London. At an exclusive club, the British and Americans used the BBC China seizure as leverage to force the Libyans to give up on their nuclear weapons program. We did have a private room to conduct business in, in this uh, very impressive uh, surrounding. Uh, it was uh, a discussion that uh, was quite difficult, and I think all of the participants in that discussion would, uh, uh, would, would agree with that characterization, and it went on for a good number of hours. This evening, Colonel Gaddafi has confirmed that Libya has now declared its intention to dismantle its weapons of mass destruction completely. A month later, a team of UN weapons inspectors arrived in Libya. They told very frankly that they had contacts with Dr. A.Q. Khan in terms of getting the technology and the meetings mid-1990s. So uh, we got a very good start. The Libyans reveal they held a series of meetings with Khan as long ago as the 1990s in Dubai, Istanbul and Casablanca. You're asking for a lot. Are you seeing it's not possible? Of course it is possible. You've come to the right people. There is no reason why what has been achieved in my country should also not be possible in yours. Inshallah. 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 But now we must discuss the costs. For a project of this scale, including production, delivery, and our expertise, the cost would be in the region of a hundred million US dollars. It's a great deal of money. But for what we're offering, surely a small price to pay. Of course, we will pay. Good. Shukran. This remains Shukran. Khan's biggest known deal. Good to do business with you. Shukran. Shukran. On the Libya trip, the inspectors were taken to a secret site on the outskirts of Tripoli.
Here they saw for themselves what the Libyans had bought. From the Khan Research Laboratories in Kahuta, vacuum pumps and rotors for centrifuges. From Malaysia, precision parts manufactured by SCOMI. Perhaps most damning of all, a bag from Khan's tailor. Inside, the Chinese nuclear warhead design. This was one-stop shopping. This was everything from enrichment of uranium to the actual warhead design. The fact that you could go to one place and you could buy basically the capability to produce nuclear weapons was something that had to be stopped. News of the Libyan investigation sent the Khan Tahir network into panic. Listen to me. Listen. Now, it is vitally important that you destroy everything relating to Libya. Yes, all the documents, all the emails, everything. It was not enough. Tahir was soon arrested and interrogated by the Malaysian police. We had several meetings with the Libyans. They asked us to supply centrifuge units for their nuclear program. Some came directly from Pakistan by air. Others had to be manufactured here in Malaysia, also Turkey, South Africa. We were active in Europe too. I arranged for all the components to be shipped through Dubai and also handled the finances. Following his confession, Tahir was remanded in custody in Malaysia, where he remains. The Pakistani authorities could protect Khan no longer. Before the nation, the father of Pakistan's nuclear bomb was forced to confess he sold his country's atomic secrets for personal gain. My dearest brothers and sisters, much of the evidence that I have been confronted with is true and accurate. I have chosen to appear before you to offer my deepest regrets and unqualified apologies to a traumatized nation. Humiliated, Khan has been under house arrest for three years. The Pakistani government insists that Khan, without their knowledge, acted alone in selling nuclear technology to Libya, Iran and North Korea. But they deny that this aided North Korea's recent nuclear test. The problem is, I don't think that the Pakistani authorities have turned over all the information they have. Iran is claiming that it bought just a certain amount of equipment from AQ Khan and nothing more. It would be good to hear from AQ Khan whether uh, they're telling the truth. Today, Natanz remains at the center of the diplomatic crisis over Iran's nuclear program. Close to completion, it'll house up to 50,000 centrifuges, enough to enrich uranium for a weapons program. Iran insists that this is for peaceful purposes only. But in Washington, few believe that President Ahmadinejad is telling the truth. Iran aggressively pursues these weapons and exports terror, while an unelected few repress the Iranian people's hope for freedom. It's very dangerous if Iran gets the bomb. And let me just add, if there had been no AQ Khan, we would not have a crisis now. Iran would not have been able to make progress on building gas centrifuges without the assistance of AQ Khan's associates. The blame for this crisis really should rest squarely with Khan. 
And it has since emerged that Khan's one-stop shopping network has been involved in more than supplying centrifuges. In late 2005, IAEA inspectors are looking through some documents in Tehran. They find one set of documents which is particularly interesting. It's a set of documents on how to cast uranium metal into a sphere. Now, what's unusual about this is this is something you only really need to do if you're making a nuclear bomb. And these documents bear very close similarities to some of the documents that came out of Libya that had been found in the Good Looks Taylor bag. They actually look like they come from the same family, the same set of documents. This immediately points to the suspicion, the suspicion that A.Q. Khan had also provided Iran with some kind of nuclear weapons information, and therefore that the Iranian program was not just peaceful, as the Iranians claim, but might have been geared towards weapons. And there are still so many unknowns. No one has access to Khan or to the diaries he's kept for the past 30 years. Khan's trade in terror began when he betrayed his colleagues and stole the West's atomic secrets. Today, his own secrets are well kept. There's just a lot of information that's vital to the security of the West, to the security of the world, that A.Q. Khan has locked away in his head that we don't have access to. I think A.Q. Khan is vastly more dangerous than Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden, at the moment, is you know, capable of nothing more than conventional terrorism. A.Q. Khan has spread weapons of mass destruction to the most dangerous regimes in the world. Nuclear weapons technology is now available on the black market. Thanks to A.Q. Khan, the trader in terror. The worst nightmare is that Khan's information will get into the hands of terrorists, or already has, and that it'll be key for them to be able to make a nuclear weapon that destroys one of our cities.